Hello and welcome to today's Immunoprecipitation Application Webinar titled Complex or Not. Your host will be Rachel Preston, Development Scientist at Biorad Laboratories. Rachel graduated from the University of Glamorgan with a BSc in Human Biology. She continued her education by obtaining an MSc degree in Bioinformatics and a PhD in Cancer Genetics from Cardiff University. Her PhD research in the group of Dr. Andrew T focused on characterizing the tumor suppression function of folliculin. Since leaving academic research, Rachel has worked as a development scientist and has gained extensive experience in immunological techniques and antibody applications. We're trying to make this webinar as interactive as possible. Therefore, please submit questions or comments via the Q&A box located at the bottom of the screen throughout the webinar. We will try to answer as many questions as possible in the session following the actual presentation. Should any questions remain unanswered, we will send you a reply by email. Please also feel free to interact with us through other channels. You can use hashtag BioradWebinars to send us IP-related questions and webinar feedback throughout the presentation. In addition to Twitter, we have a presence on other social media channels, including Facebook, Pinterest, and YouTube. We also regularly publish articles about current scientific discussions, antibody applications, and the latest scientific discoveries on our blog page. Please feel free to check it out and comment on one of the many articles. All of our social media channels can be accessed via the social media icons at the bottom of the screen. The IP webinar will be recorded and an on-demand version will be available shortly after the webinar on the BioRad website. Also, many of the resources described in this webinar can be accessed at the bottom of the screen. Should you encounter any technical problems during the webinar, please click on the question mark at the bottom of the screen. This will bring up the technical guide, which describes solutions for the most common technical problems. I hope you will enjoy the webinar, and I now hand over to Rachel. Hello, everybody. So what topics will we be covering in today's webinar? There will be a quick introduction in which we will discuss what an IP is and what researchers are trying to achieve by performing IP experiments. I will also provide an overview of a basic and representative IP protocol. From there, we will be moving on to how to design an IP experiment. This section will cover what B-type to use, selecting the best antibody for the pull-down, and choosing the optimal elution method for immunoprecipitating your protein from beads. I will then discuss the most critical experimental controls and best practices for IP experiments. This part of the webinar will be followed by discussing co-IPs and their experimental setup. For the last part of the webinar, I will highlight the most common pitfalls and give you some experimental troubleshooting advice. Finally, the webinar will conclude with a Q&A session. What is an IP? Immunoprecipitation, commonly abbreviated as IP, and also referred to as pull-down, is the precipitation of a specific protein out of a cell or tissue lysate with the help of an antibody which binds specifically to that protein. The antibody, which targets your protein of interest, is conjugated to magnetic beads such as Biorad Shore beads, also frequently used as cephorose or agarose beads. All beads have been coated with either protein A or protein G. Once the antibody is bound to the beads, lysate is added allowing the binding of the antibody to the protein of interest. The antibody should specifically pull down your protein of interest and thereby any interaction partners that may be bound to this protein. However, some proteins may non-specifically and weakly bind to beads. These proteins are then removed through a series of wash steps. In contrast to these other proteins, the target protein, due to its stronger binding, is retained on the beads and diluted off the beads in the final step of the IP procedure. What is the purpose of an IP experiment? Probably the most common application of IP experiments is the identification of new interaction partners and the characterization of protein complexes through the help of co-IPs. IPs may also be used to identify post-translational modifications. This is especially common when the immunoprecipitated proteins are to be analyzed by mass spectrometry. Another application of IP experiments is the concentration or enrichment of a specific protein or modified form of a protein from a lysate containing vast quantities of different proteins. 
In this scenario, IPs are often performed as a pre-step to Western blotting experiments. This diagram gives you an overview of a basic IP protocol using BioRed shore beads. The diagram also depicts Western blot detection of the IP sample. In step two, the beads which have been coated with either protein A or protein G, see step one, are incubated with an antibody targeting your protein of interest. The beads are then magnetically captured and any unbound antibody is removed in a series of wash steps. The sample, most likely a cell lysate containing your target protein, is then added to the beads. This is shown in step three. After an incubation period of lysate and beads, the beads are magnetically captured, the supernatant is removed, and any unbound proteins are washed off in a series of wash steps. And this is shown in uh, step four. Finally, to dissociate your bound target protein from beads, elution buffer is added. Once added, the beads are magnetized and the purified target protein is collected. This is summarized in step five. I will discuss the Western blot detection of IP samples, step six and seven, later in the webinar. If you are interested in learning more about this workflow, please go to BioRad Antibodies website and enter slash IP hyphen workflow. I'm now moving on to the experimental design part of the webinar. First, we will discuss the importance of selecting the optimal lysis buffer for preparing samples on which you will perform an IP experiment. What are the criteria for selecting the optimal lysis buffer? First of all, the optimal lysis buffer has to conserve the native conformation of your protein of interest while also efficiently lysing cells or tissue. It is critical to add inhibitors such as protease and phosphatase inhibitors freshly to your lysis buffer to preserve your protein of interest and any potential post-translational modifications. Proteases in particular are very active in cell lysates and the addition of protease inhibitors is essential to prevent your protein from being proteolytically degraded. As a general rule, lysis with lysis buffers containing non-ionic detergents, such as NP40, tend to be milder compared to lysis with ionic detergent-based lysis buffers. To summarize, lysis buffer selection depends on your protein of interest and its modification status. For example, if you are intending to analyze ubiquitinated or phosphorylated proteins, the addition of specific proteasome, deubiquitinase, and phosphatase inhibitors is critical. Protein abundance also plays a role, as you might like to use as little lysis buffer as possible when you intend to immunoprecipitate a very low abundant protein. Lysis buffers can be classed into two main categories, denaturing and non-denaturing lysis buffers. Non-denaturing lysis buffers contain detergents such as NP40 or Triton X100 and are suitable to use when your target protein is soluble in these detergents. However, when performing lysis with a lysis buffer containing Triton X100, some proteins may remain in the Triton X100 insoluble fraction. Certain cytoskeletal proteins, for example, are known to remain in the Triton insoluble fraction. Buffers containing non-ionic detergents such as Triton are especially suitable when the IP antibody binds to the protein of interest in its native form. Denaturing lysis buffers contain components such as sodium dodecyl sulfate, abbreviated as SDS, and sodium deoxycholate. One frequently used denaturing lysis buffer is radioimmunoprecipitation assay, abbreviated as REPA buffer. REPA buffer is especially suitable when the disruption of the nuclear membrane is required. This lysis buffer type may also solubilize proteins which would be insoluble in buffers containing less stringent detergents, such as Triton X100. However, REPA buffer may denature kinases, as highlighted by Kuthon et al. 1996. To summarize, it is important to consider the nature of your protein of interest in terms of protein family type and cellular location before finalizing your lysis buffer choice. In addition to the lysis buffer type, it is also important to note that the concentration of your prepared lysate may have an effect on the IP efficiency. The example shown here to highlight the impact of lysate concentrations is a PCNA IP performed using different concentrations of Jercat cell lysate. 
Lysate concentrated at 2, 1, and 0.5 milligrams per mil was used for immunoprecipitating PCNA, with 10 micrograms of mouse anti-PCNA antibody. On this slide, you can see a PCNA western blot of the different PCNA IPs performed on the different lysate concentrations. HRP conjugated tidy blot was used as a secondary detection reagent. We will discuss tidy blot in more detail later in the webinar. For now, please note that the product can be used as a substitute for a secondary antibody. I mentioned that tidy blot is HRP conjugated. Therefore, please be aware that the western blot has been pseudo-colored. The chemiluminescence channel is shown in red, and the green has been used to color the protein standards. Please note that the pseudo-coloring described here applies to all western blots shown in this webinar. You can clearly see that the intensity of the band of interest, in this case PCNA, increases with increased lysate concentration. The IP performed with the 2 mg per mil lysate in lane 1 resulted in the best PCNA recovery. It is important to note that the described correlation between lysate concentration and pull-down efficiency may not always be observed. Please keep in mind that IP efficiency depends on levels of your target protein present in your lysate relative to the amount of IP antibody used. Also critical is how efficient the IP antibody is at binding to your protein of interest. If your protein of interest is highly abundant, you may have saturated the amount of IP antibody at lower lysate concentrations already. Therefore, increasing the lysate concentration will not increase IP efficiency in this scenario. I will now move on to discussing the importance of antibody selection for the design of an IP experiment. It is important to select an antibody that has been IP tested whenever possible. I've shown an example of one of our GAP-DH antibodies here. You can see in the application tab that the antibody has been tested in IP. However, depending on your protein of interest, it may be difficult to find an IP tested antibody. Based on this, I'm going to discuss a few guidelines and things to bear in mind when selecting an antibody that you intend to use in an IP. The most important selection criterion for choosing an IP antibody is that the antibody detects a native confirmation of your protein of interest. This means that the antibody has to target an epitope that is exposed in the native confirmation of the protein. Protein folding websites can assist in determining whether the epitope an antibody is targeting is exposed in the na protein's native confirmation. Another good indication as to whether or not an antibody might work in IP is what other applications the antibody is recommended in. If the antibody works in an application such as flow cytometry, which usually requires the detection of the native protein confirmation, this provides a good indication that the antibody could potentially work in IP. You can also use an antibody against an epitope tag if the cells have been transfected with a knock-in or overexpression construct. This is often the case with co-IPs, which I will discuss later in the webinar. Proteins expressed as a result of transfection of overexpression or knock-in constructs are often fused to tags such as CMIC or HIS. These tags enable detection and immunoprecipitation of proteins even when no antibody is available against that particular target. For example, cells could be transfected with an overexpression construct for HA tags AKT. For the IP, you could therefore use an antibody against the HA tag or an antibody against AKT. Please be cautious when interpreting the results of an IP experiment using overexpression cells, as observed protein-protein interactions may not be physiologically relevant. Another important factor for the success of an IP assay is the selection of the best bead type. Initially, agarose or cephrose beads were used to perform IPs. However, magnetic beads appear to have increased in popularity. Based on this trend, this slide provides a comparison between magnetic and agarose beads. Magnetic beads may have a higher cost per IP than agarose or cephrose beads. However, you may need to use less antibody and there is less risk of losing beads during wash steps. This is due to the beads being held by a magnet during these wash steps, which is significantly easier than having to pellet agarose beads by centrifugation and manually having to remove the supernatant. In addition to convenience, IPs performed with magnetic beads may generally result in cleaner IPs. 
Magnetic beads may therefore be a more appropriate solution for those of you who aim to identify novel protein-protein interaction. For these types of studies, the IP needs to be as clean as possible, and it's essential to avoid non-specific binding. For more information about Biorad Shore Beads Magnetic Beads, and for an overview of the benefits of Shore Beads compared to Agarose Beads, please go to our Shore Beads webpage. Another important criterion to bear in mind when choosing your bead type is the binding affinity of your IP antibody to protein A and protein G. Both magnetic and agarose beads tend to be offered in both formats, allowing you to pick the best option for your respective antibody. The choice depends on host species, isotype and subtype of your IP antibody. For some mouse IgG subtypes, such as mouse IgG2A, you can use protein A or protein G beads as mouse IgG2A antibodies bind equally well to both protein A and protein G. For some rat IgG subtypes, such as rat IgG2A, it is however critical to use protein G beads. Protein A beads cannot be used, as rat IgG2A has no binding affinity to protein A. Beads coated with protein G should therefore exclusively be used when performing an IP with an antibody of this rat IgG subtype. In general, it is best to consult an antibody binding affinity table to ensure that you are selecting the optimal B type. For an overview of antibody binding affinities to protein A and protein G, please go to the birad-antibodies.com website and enter slash binding hyphen affinities. We are now going to discuss the different methods available for eluting captured proteins off of the IP beads. The most common buffer types used for the elution step of an IP experiment are direct elution into sample buffer containing SDS or elution with glycine-based buffers. SDS-based elution buffers are highly efficient at eluting proteins off of beads. This type of buffer is therefore a good starting point when you are unsure about the most suitable elution method for your protein. When selecting this method, Please be aware that denaturing buffers such as these are the harshest of all available elution buffers. SDS-based elution buffers often elute antibodies from beads in addition to the bound proteins. This results in the presence of antibodies in your IP sample, which may result in background and potential masking of your proteins of interest when performing Western blot analysis of your IP sample. If you are concerned about the amount of antibody you may elute off of the beads, my recommendation is to add reducing agents such as DTT or beta-mecaptoethanol post elution as this minimizes elution of antibody from beads. As SDS-based buffers are denaturing, these buffers may not be suitable for some downstream applications. The sample is also heat-treated, generally by heating it to 70 degrees C for approximately 10 minutes during the elution process, rendering this method unsuitable for studying some protein-protein interactions. Glycine-based elution buffers rely on a change in pH to dissociate the bound proteins from beads. The pH range of these buffers is between 2 and 3. Compared to the SDS-based elution method described on the previous slides, glycine-based elution methods are gentler and often result in reduced presence of antibody in the final IP sample. These buffer types are also non-denaturing and so may provide a more appropriate elution method for some downstream applications in which you might like to study native proteins. However, please keep in mind that glycine-based buffers are not universally effective. In summary, the choice of elution buffer can have a big impact on the results of an IP experiment. Here is an example of a PCNA IP performed using glycine and SDS-based elution methods. The IPs were performed in the same manner only the elution step at the end of the IP procedure was performed differently. You can see from the PCNA Western blot that the IP sample eluted using the SDS solution method results in detection of a band of interest at the correct molecular weight for PCNA. The Western blot, however, shows no band of interest for the IP sample eluted using the glycine elution method. To summarise, in this instance, eluting directly in sample buffer resulted in better PCNA recovery compared to eluting with a glycine-containing elution buffer. When unsure about which elution method to use, I would recommend trying sample buffer first. We have finished the experimental design part of the webinar. Now we'll now move on to talking about what essential controls to include in an IP experiment.
During this section, I will also cover best IP practices. Just a reminder, if you have not already done so, please send us any questions or comments via the Q&A box. There are two types of controls I would class as essential for an IP experiment. The first type of control is the whole cell or tissue lysate, abbreviated as WCL or WTL, from which you have performed your IP. This type of control is commonly referred to as input. My recommendation would be to run this control alongside your IP sample on your SDS page gel. This control allows you to check for the presence of your protein of interest in your sample and therefore provides quality control for your starting material. Additionally, this control provides information about whether the antibody used for the Western blot detection of your protein of interest is able to detect your protein. Input controls also help to determine IP efficiencies and to assess enrichment of your target protein in the IP sample. It is also important to include a negative control, otherwise known as an isotype control or mock IP in every IP experiment. To generate the type of control, you perform an IP using an unrelated antibody of the same host species and isotype as the target antibody. This type of control addresses the non-specific binding of proteins contained in the lysate to beads and assists in determining background levels. Including this type of control in your experiment, therefore, helps to confirm that you are not detecting artifacts that originate from non-specific binding. I would now like to discuss best IP practices. I have listed four best practices to follow when performing an IP experiment, and we'll start this section by discussing the importance of pre-clearing lysates. A pre-clearing step, such as the one outlined in the displayed screenshot of our IP protocol webpage, involves the addition of an irrelevant antibody of the same isotype as the IP antibody to the lysate prior to the addition of the IP antibody. The lysate, which has been incubated with the irrelevant antibody, is then incubated with protein A or protein G beads, depending on the isotype. The samples are spun in the case of agarose beads and magnetized in the case of magnetic beads, and the supernatant is removed from the beads. This helps to reduce non-specific binding, as any proteins in the lysate that would bind non-specifically to the IP antibody due to its isotype have been retained on the beads. You therefore have removed these beads from the lysate that you will then use for the actual IP. For more information about pre-clearing and for an overview of our IP protocol using sure beads, please go to our BioRed Antibodies website and enter slash IP hyphen protocol. Pre-clearing of lysates is of particular importance when performing Kamasi staining of IP samples. This slide shows a Kamasi staining of a GAP-DH IP with BioRad's BioSafe Kumasi stain. GAP-DH is a very highly abundant protein, and therefore you can see the GAP-DH band clearly on gel staining. Bands of interest are often excised from Kamasi gels and sent for mass spectrometry analysis. The aim of this type of analysis is the identification of potential new interactors with your protein of interest or the analysis of post-translational modification sites. When performing mass spectrometry analysis, it is important that your IP sample show as little background and contain as few contaminants as possible. This increases confidence in the relevance of the stained bands. You are more assured that the observed bands present on your gel are indeed your protein of interest and its interaction partners rather than proteins binding non-specifically. Another best IP practice I would like to discuss is the titration of your IP antibody. Titrations are essential to determine the optimal amount of antibody to use. This ensures the best recovery of your protein of interest. This slide shows an example of an NF-kappa-B P65 IP experiment. To determine what amount of antibody results in the most efficient pull-down, titrations of the sheep anti-NF-kappa-B P65 antibody have been performed. In this instance, the IP was performed using 10, 5, and 1 micrograms of the antibody. You can see that the intensity of the band of interest is greatest in the IP performed with 10 micrograms of antibody. This suggests that in this instance, this is the optimal amount of antibody for recovering NF-kappa-B P65. My recommendation is that you always perform a titration of your IP antibody, as this parameter can really affect the efficiency of your IP experiment. The next piece of advice on best IP practice is related to the Western blot detection of IP samples. <coughs> 
It's best practice to perform Western blot analysis of your protein of interest using a different antibody from the IP antibody. This increases the likelihood that the band present in the Western blot is your band of interest rather than a protein that the antibody is binding to non-specifically. In this example, a GAP-DHIP was performed using a mouse anti-GAP-DH antibody. However, for the Western blot detection, a rabbit anti-GAP-DH was used. My recommendation is that, if possible, I would use IP and detection antibodies from different host species. So, what is the reason behind selecting two different antibodies? If an antibody is binding non-specifically to a protein in IP, it might also bind to the same protein non-specifically in Western blotting. Using a different antibody for the Western blot detection to the one used for the IP provides assurance that the GAP-DH detected by Western blotting is indeed GAP-DH and not another protein that the IP antibody non-specifically binds to. For the final piece of best practice advice, I would like to discuss the importance of showing total protein levels on your gel or Western blot. This helps to show equal loading. Should you have eluted antibodies off of the beads during the elution step, you can also show that you use the same amounts of antibody by showing the antibody heavy and light chains. One quick and convenient way to show total protein levels is to use stain-free imaging technology. I will discuss the technology further on the next slides. Stain-free technology enables the visualization of proteins in SDS page gels without the need for staining or destaining of gels. This allows a quick and convenient visualization of proteins on your gel prior to Western blotting. Biorad offers mini and midi-sized stain-free precast gels, which contain trihalo compounds. The trihalo compounds within the gel are covalently linked to tryptophan residues in proteins when activated by UV light. Activation results in the addition of a 58 Dalton moiety to each tryptophan, which fluoresces after another brief exposure to UV light. This enables protein visualization. Stain-free technology therefore enables the normalization of Western blot band intensities against total protein levels from the sample loaded onto the gel. In summary, this enables you to perform subsequent relative quantification analysis. For more information about the stain-free imaging technology, please refer to our dedicated web pages. If you have problems locating these pages, just let us know via the Q&A box and we will mail you the information. This gel is the same NF-kappa BP65 IP experiment I showed you on slide 29 when we were discussing IP antibody titrations. In addition to the Western blot data we reviewed earlier, this slide also displays the matching stain-free gel image. This image clearly shows the IgG heavy and light chains of the sheep anti-NF-kappa B IgG antibody used for the IP. I mentioned in the elution section that antibodies are often eluted with the retained proteins from the beads. In this case, the sheep NF-kappa B IgG antibody was eluted off of the beads and denaturing of the IP sample resulted in the breakdown of these antibodies into IgG heavy and light chains. The IgG heavy chain has a molecular weight of 50 kilodaltons and the light chain of 25 kilodaltons. The stain-free technology allows the normalization of the NF-kappa B P65 band intensities to the light chain shown in the stain-free image. This enables the determination of what amount of NF-kappa B P65 antibody results in the most efficient IP. Or to word this slightly differently, the best ratio of antibodies to target protein recovered. This bar graph shows the relative quantification of the NF-kappa B P65 data shown on the previous slide. The IP relative quantification analysis was performed using ImageLab software. Volume or intensity of the NF-kappa B P65 band in the IP performed with the 10 micrograms of antibody was selected as the reference volume. Normalization was performed to the relative volume intensities of the bands representing the IgG light chains in the respective 5 microgram and 1 microgram lanes in the same free gel image. In this example, the relative intensity of our band of interest is greatest in the sample from the IP performed with 10 micrograms of antibody. We have now completed the controls and best practice section of the webinar, and we will move on to co-IP and talking about setting up co-IP experiments.
Co-IP is the IP experiments performed with the intention of detecting protein-protein interactions or pulling down entire protein complexes. In a Co-IP experiment, you pull down a specific protein with the help of a target-specific antibody. When eluting a protein of interest, you will also elute direct and indirect interaction partners that are bound to your protein of interest and you have therefore co-immunoprecipitated. Co-IP experiments may be performed to identify new interaction partners or to determine the effect of a particular condition or treatment on an established interaction. It is important to consider the purpose of your Co-IP experiment when setting up or designing these types of experiments. Of particular importance is deciding which controls to include. This may vary depending on the purpose of your Co-IP. Co-IP experiments are often performed on cells which have been transfected with overexpression or knock-in vectors. It is important to be cautious when interpreting IP results generated with cells overexpressing proteins, as any interactions established need to be physiologically relevant. For example, transfection with overexpression constructs may result in proteins being expressed at significantly higher levels, which could potentially result in a protein being expressed in cellular compartments as it would not normally be expressed in. In addition to the other controls mentioned in this webinar, when using transfected cells, it is important to include IPs that have been performed on cells which have been transfected with an empty vector. This allows you to control for any effect that the transfection procedure and protein tags may have on the IP and especially non-specific binding. If the purpose of your co-IP experiment is to analyze an established interaction, for example, you might want to assess the effect of a particular treatment or condition on an interaction, it is first of all important to understand how the interaction is mediated. Do you have to induce the interaction, for example? Is the interaction transient and therefore might require the use of cross-linking reagents to stabilize the interaction? Is the interaction occurring in a particular cellular compartment and therefore may require enrichment by performing cellular fractionation? It's important to run through these questions to ensure that you get the co-IP experimental setup right. Additionally, it is important to carefully select what B type to use for the co-IP. The advantage of reduced sample loss with magnetic beads may make it easier to load equal amounts of IP sample from each treatment or condition when using this bead type. It is also important to visualize total protein levels of your co-IP sample. For this purpose, you could use the stain-free technology we discussed earlier. The fact that you can normalize levels of your protein of interest to a band of your choice in the stain-free image for relative quantification may also be beneficial for this type of experiment. This ensures that any observed intensity differences of your band of interest are as a result of the treatment or condition rather than the effects of unequal gel loading. When conducting a co-IP for the purpose of identifying novel interaction partners, it is essential that the IPs are performed both ways. By that, I mean that IPs are performed which target each of the interactors. Again, it is important to consider what B-type to use when performing a co-IP for this purpose. The fact that magnetic beads often produce cleaner IP results due to the ease of washing may make them the most appropriate choice. In addition to reduced background levels due to more efficient washing, magnetic beads also have the added advantage of lower risk of sample loss. Pre-clearing your cell lysate and running mock IPs are important considerations when designing co-IP experiments. Pre-clearing reduces the risk of non-specific binding, while the mock IP allows you to control for and assess potential non-specific binding. I would just like to caution you about the interpretation of co-IP results. Pulling down an interaction partner of your protein of interest in a co-IP does not imply that your protein of interest and the interaction partner interact directly. The interaction of these two proteins may be indirect and mediated by an adapter protein. This slide shows an example of a co-IP of the membrane protein Ezrin and the adapter EBP50. The Ezrin IP was performed on lysate of HEC293 cells overexpressing tag to Ezrin using 10 micrograms of rabbit anti-tag antibody. For the mock IP, 10 micrograms of polyclonal rabbit IgG was used. Western blot detection was then performed with a mouse anti-EBP50 antibody. EBP50 was detected in the IP, not in the mock IP sample, which highlights specificity. The interaction between EBP50 and Ezrin is well established. 
However, if the observed interaction was a novel one, an IP targeting EBP50 followed by detection with an anti esmerin antibody would be required in order to confirm the interaction. As highlighted earlier, it is essential to perform the co-IPs both ways. We have now reached the common pitfalls and troubleshooting section of the webinar. What are some of the most common pitfalls when performing an IP experiment, and how can you avoid them? Well, one of the most common pitfalls is not enriching your sample enough prior to performing the IP. In order to enrich your sample, you could perform cellular fractionation or increase your lysate concentration by reducing the amount of lysis buffer. For instance, prior to performing the IP, you could consult the literature to determine how abundant your target protein is and whether it's located in a particular cellular fraction. This would enable you to establish whether enrichment via fractionation may be necessary. Please bear in mind that the best way of fractionating cells may depend on the type of cells being used and the type of interaction you're trying to detect. Another pitfall is inappropriate bead selection. For example, selecting a bead type to which the IP antibody does not bind. Ensure you know the species and isotype of the IP antibody and that you have chosen protein A or protein G coupled beads in line with the optimal binding affinities of the IP antibody. Another common error is inappropriate antibody selection. For example, the antibody chosen for the IP does not bind to the native conformation of the target protein. Again, identify an antibody that has been IP tested. If you are unable to identify such an antibody, make sure to use an antibody that is likely to be able to bind to the native conformation of your target protein. You can assess this capability by selecting an antibody that has been tested in other applications where the antibody binds to the native conformation of the protein. Such an application could be flow cytometry. Alternatively, you could check that the epitope the antibody binds to is in a region that is exposed when the protein is folded. To ensure optimal recovery of your target, always perform an antibody titration to ensure that you use the amount of antibody resulting in the most efficient pull down of your target protein. And finally, inappropriate lysis or elution buffer selection can have a detrimental effect on your IP. In general, start with an SDS-based dilution buffer unless you want to analyze native proteins. For analysis of native proteins, you do not want to denature your sample, and therefore glycine-based buffers may be more appropriate. Omitting to include appropriate controls such as a mock IP, whole cell lysate, or an empty vector control for transfections in the case of co-IPs is another common oversight. It is important to include as many of the recommended controls as possible in order to give you confidence in your IP results. Including the right controls also helps you when you need to troubleshoot. It is a lot more difficult to determine how and where things went wrong in your experiment without being able to analyze the controls. Another frequently encountered problem is caused by insufficient bead washing. This failure may result in high backgrounds or presence of bands in your mock IP. It is important to ensure that you take off as much supernatant as possible during washing without disturbing the beads. Again, this is easier with magnetic beads as the risk of disturbing magnetized beads is lower. Magnetic beads can then also help to minimize sample loss, which is another common problem. I will now take you through some troubleshooting tips for Western blot detection of IP samples. If you are unable to detect your immunoprecipitated protein by Western blotting, I would suggest reviewing the whole cell lysate control to determine if your protein of interest was originally present in the sample. It is also important to confirm that your selected Western blotting antibodies are working. To control for this, you could include a positive control cell lysate, which expresses the protein you are trying to detect. This may be the whole cell lysate, a recombinant protein, or an overexpression cell lysate. If you cannot detect your protein of interest in the positive control, this may suggest that the primary or secondary antibodies are not working. To establish the presence of your protein of interest in your IP sample, you could also assess whether you can visualize your protein of interest on a stain-free gel or chromatic staining of your IP samples. If you are able to visualize your target protein on your gel, this may provide further indication that the primary or secondary antibodies are not working. If you are unable to visualize your protein of interest on your gel, 
This may suggest that the IP antibody is unable to bind to your protein of interest. For example, the antibody may not bind to the native conformation of your target protein. Alternatively, the target protein may be a very low abundant one, and you therefore may need to concentrate your sample or perform cellular fractionations before the IP. Elution buffer selection may also need to be reviewed. If you are unable to detect a known interactor by IP, this may be due to the interaction being transient. You therefore might need to use crosslinkers to stabilize the interaction and allow co-immunoprecipitation of the two proteins. It may also be possible that the interaction depends upon a particular modification, such as a phosphorylation event, that you actively need to induce by treating cells. Refer to the scientific literature to determine whether the interaction may be dependent on a post-translational modification. It is also important to ensure that you have added phosphatase inhibitors freshly to your lysis buffer prior to the analyzing of the cells for use in IP. Certain interactions may also require sample enrichment to increase detection. For example, only a small fraction of your protein of interest may interact with other proteins. Therefore, a more concentrated lysate may be required for the interaction to be detectable. The interaction could potentially also be limited to a certain cellular compartment or fraction, and therefore fractionation may be required. Two common indicators of high background exist. The first is the presence of antibody fragments, and the second is the presence of proteins and maybe even your target protein in the mock IP. If antibody fragments are present on a Kamasi stain gel, which mask your protein of interest or potential interaction partners, Perform a titration of your IP antibody. This ensures that you use as little antibody as possible. If you are planning to add a reducing agent such as DTT or beta mercaptoethanol to your sample, add this reagent after the elution step rather than directly to the sample buffer. You could also review whether a different elution buffer is required. If a band representing your target protein is present in the mock IP, pre the prior to the IP to minimize nonspecific binding. It is also important to wash your samples thoroughly during each wash step and to remove as much supernatant as possible. You also want to ensure that you are using clean containers to perform your Kamasi staining in. Unclean containers are a common source of gel contaminants. When antibody fragments are masking your protein of interest when performing Western blot detection of IP samples, my recommendation is that you review your detection antibody. As you have seen in the discussed webinar examples, it is best to use IP and Western blotting antibodies from different host species. Also ensure that the secondary antibody used for the Western blot detection is cross-absorbed against the host species of the IP antibody. In cases where you have to use IP and Western blotting antibodies from the same species, my recommendation is to use the secondary antibody specific for the light or the FC region of the heavy chain of your host species. For example, you could use a rabbit IgG light chain specific antibody for detection of a 50 kilodalton protein. Using this secondary antibody would still result in the detection of the IgG light chain, however, not in detection of the 50 kilodalton heavy chain, which would mask your protein of interest as they have the same molecular weight. You can avoid detection of the IgG heavy and light chains entirely by using detection reagents such as tidy blot, which exclusively detect the native antibodies. You may remember this slide from the beginning of the webinar when I showed you the different steps of an IP experiment. I would now like to focus on step seven, the Western blot detection of IP samples. Interference from antibody fragments is a common problem when performing Western blot detection of IP samples. Antibodies are frequently eluted off of beads and are therefore present in the IP samples. Due to the denaturing and reducing process, these antibodies are broken into fragments. For IgG, this means a breakdown into IgG heavy and light chains. When the IP sample is analyzed by Western blotting, conventional heavy and light chain secondary antibodies will bind to these fragments. You can see this on the left-hand Western blot image, where the use of conventional secondary antibody results in the detection of the 50 kilodalton heavy and 25 kilodalton light chains. Reagents such as tidy blot will not detect denatured IgG chains, as this reagent type binds exclusively to native antibodies, 
Therefore, tidy blot will only bind to the antibody used in the Western blotting and not to a looted and denatured antibody present in the IP sample. The use of tidy blot therefore mitigates interference from IgG heavy and light chain and the potential masking of your protein of interest associated with this. Tidy blot is also especially useful when the identification of new interaction partners by co-IP is desired. Using conventional secondary antibodies may result in you missing out on detecting a new interaction partner as this protein might be masked by the chains. If you are interested in learning more about tidy blot and the Western blot detection of IP samples, please go to the biorad-antibodies website slash IP-workflow. In support of the webinar, we have also created an IP tips and tricks webpage that lists 10 tips and tricks for Western blot detection of IP samples. You can access these tips on our website biradantibodies.com slash IP hyphen tips. For an overview of our IP application resources, to browse our IP tested antibodies, or to access the resources such as the IP protocol and antibody binding affinities to protein A and protein G mentioned during the webinar, go to our website biorad-antibodies.com slash IP. In addition to immunoprecipitation, we offer resources for other antibody applications including flow cytometry, immunoassays, immunofluorescence, immunohistochemistry and western blotting. These resources can be accessed on the Biorad Antibodies website by entering slash applications, which will bring you to our application landing page. Resources available to support the different antibody applications include detailed information on how to best control your experiments, our flow cytometry application guide, easy to follow protocols, hands-on tips and tricks and webinars. You might be interested in our on-demand IHC webinar entitled Mastering IHC Staining Experiments and our flow cytometry webinar titled Optimize Your Flow Cytometry Best Practice for Sample Preparation, Staining and Analysis. We also have a number of research area specific on-demand webinars available on our website. These include our popular apoptosis webinar titled Question of Life or Death Differentiating Between Apoptotic and Healthy Cells. All webinars can be viewed on our dedicated webinar page by entering biorideantibodies.com slash webinar into your browser. This page also lists all upcoming webinars, so it's worthwhile having a browse. For information about how to get in touch with our technical support team, please visit our website biorideantibodies.com slash technical. Alternatively, meet us in person at a conference near you. We will be exhibiting at the Society for Neuroscience annual meeting in uh, San Diego in November. Our booth number is 1529 and we are looking forward to meeting you there. For the Q&A session, I am joined by another member of our team, Dr. Steve Clasper. Steve holds a PhD degree in biochemistry from Liverpool University and has a wide range of experience in antibody applications that he gained in both academia and in industry. So I'll now hand you over to Steve for the first question. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, the first question we have is, can you store lysates before you perform the IP? And although we'd always advise you to perform your IP as quickly as you can after the lysis procedure, uh, obviously there are times when you can't do this, so it is certainly possible to store them before your IP. We'd recommend that you include phosphatase inhibitors and protease inhibitors be and that you lyse the IP on ice. Uh, but then you, you can store them, and we would suggest uh, between minus 70 and minus 80 in a freezer so that you minimize any degradation of the proteins. What you might notice when you thaw them is some of the detergents, such as SDS, will precipitate out uh, due to the low temperature. So we recommend that you make sure everything is resolubilized by warming them up before you go any further. The next question we have is, can you reuse a lysate for different targets? Uh, it's a very interesting question. Obviously, there are times when you have very precious samples uh, and you might want to IP more than one antigen from the sample. So what we suggest is that providing you can get enough lysate recovered from the beads for another uh, IP, you should be able to do this. You may find you may need to add some more uh, lysing buffer uh, or uh, recovery buffer 
to the IP beads uh, with a subsequent decrease in concentration. The thing you have to bear in mind is uh, how specific your target antibody is and how this might affect your next target that you're trying to pull down. If the second target is pulling down a potential interactor of the first target, then it might be that you've already co-immunoprecipitated your second target with your first target in the initial immunoprecipitation. It might also be worth considering that if you intend to include a negative control or a mock IP alongside your second target, that the lysate being used for both of these IPs needs to have been treated in an identical manner during the previous round of IPs. So what you might find is it's easiest to actually pool your mock and target lysates at the starting point before you perform your second IP. Uh, okay, I'm going to hand you over, back over to Rachel. She's been looking through some of the questions. Thank you, Steve. So our next question is, um, if there is a target left in the lysate, can you re-IP, and is it worth it? In answer to whether you can re-IP a lysate, this depends on how efficient your IP is, by which I mean how well your antibody binds to your protein of interest and how abundant that target protein is in your lysate. If your target is highly abundant, it might be possible um, that you've saturated your antibody during the incubation step of the IP process, and that repeating this process will result in pull down of your target protein during the second IP, which will probably be almost as efficient as the first IP. If this is something you would potentially consider doing, um, I would again run a sample of the lysic once it's been removed after incubation with the beads coated with the antibody targeting your protein of interest in and performing a Western blot after the first IP in order to see if there's any of your protein of interest remaining in your sample. Um, whether it's worth it or not, it depends on whether you are planning, um, you know, what you're planning on doing with your sample once it's been IP'd. Um, are you looking to have more sample in order to perform a greater number of experiments? So do you want to increase the number of Western blots you can perform, for example? In which case, if your target's relatively abundant, um, and you're going to get a good level of efficiency from your second IP, then performing this would allow you to accumulate more of your protein, which you could then use for more experiments. However, it's probably worth bearing in mind that although the amount of protein that you pull down may increase as a result of your second IP, the concentration of the protein within your sample won't. So if you were looking to increase the amount of protein that you're pulling down due to issues with detection um, of your protein in Western blot or chemassy staining, I would probably not recommend this as a solution. Instead, I would consider concentrating um, the lysate prior to IP or fractionation in order to try and enrich your protein of interest. The next question is, I'm going to be attempting to IP a protein that is known to be of relatively low abundance, followed by mass spectrometry. As well as making my lysate as concentrated as possible, I'm obviously concerned about the um, efficient elution of my target protein off of the beads. You mentioned SDS and glycine-based elution buffers. Are there any other options that I should be considering? Well, as you say, I would start with an SDS-based elution buffer, as this type of buffer is probably going to be the most efficient at eluting your protein off of the beads. You could also consider elution with a urea-based buffer, um, as this might be more suitable for mass spectrometry analysis. The beads could also be washed with the urea-based buffer after the initial elution step in order to ensure total elution of your protein of interest from the beads. The supernatant from each elution is then pulled. Um, for example, I've heard of people washing their beads in a urea chaps buffer after the elution um, into SDS-based buffer uh, in order to ensure complete elution of their target protein. This was prior to 2D gel electrophoresis and mass spectrometry. It was actually a paper by Suzer et al. Um, that goes into this in more detail. Um, and we might mention it on the tips and tricks, actually. Um, so it might be worth consulting this for more information. Uh, the next question is, what detection system did you use in your Western block experiments? Um, did you use fluorescence? Um, all of the secondary detection reagents used to perform the Western blocks shown in this webinar um, are in fact HRP conjugated. The um, blocks have, however, been pseudocolored, so the chemiluminescence channel has been pseudocolored in red, and the protein standards have been pseudocolored in green. 
The next question I'm going to answer is, what is the best way to perform an IP on a 250 kilodalton protein in order to look at protein interactions? Now, you pull down a 250 kilodalton protein um, via IP in the same manner as a protein of any other um, molecular weight. The issue is going to be um, detection of this protein and any interactors. Um, so what I would recommend is that you run a reduced sample um, on a gel and make sure that you run this sample um, long enough to be able to get a 250 kilodalton protein actually onto your gel. Um, I would then follow this with um, mass spectrometry or um, Western blot, um, which might target either your um, protein of interest or um, any interactions interactors you think might be there. Um, however, you would have to bear in mind that this would be obviously at the molecular weight of that protein that you're trying to detect rather than um, the molecular weight that it might be within a, a complex. So I'll now hand you back over to Steve. Okay, I have another question here. I suspect my protein of interest may be part of a complex you discussed trying different elution buffer methods followed by running the IP samples on reducing gels to detect interaction partners. Do you have any other suggestions for analyzing protein complexes or interactions? Okay, some of the non-denaturing elution methods could potentially preserve the complex or at least some of the interactions. However, in addition to running those IP samples on a denaturing SDS page gel, you might also want to consider running samples on a native gel. Now, a native gel doesn't contain SDS, and so the proteins are in their native conformation. They retain their native charge, and they also retain any interaction with other proteins. So this method might therefore give you an idea whether your protein is part of a complex. What you do need to keep in mind, however, is that it's very hard to accurately determine the molecular weight of any protein on a native gel because the migration of the protein is dependent on its size and its native charge. There are some molecular weight standards available which are suitable for native gels, but again, it's a compromise. A good reference would be to load a purified or a competent version of your protein onto the native gel. And you can, also, you can then compare this with your IP sample, and it could give you an indication of whether or not your sample is part of a complex. You could also go further, actually, and blot this native gel and then probe it uh, using Western blot techniques. The next question is, for membrane complexes, do you recommend detergent concentrations above or below the critical micelle concentration? Unfortunately, there's no straight answer to this because it will be different for every protein. So what you need to do is determine it empirically by experimenting with probably initially a standard reaper buffer, and if this doesn't give you a satisfactory result, you'll probably need to decrease or increase the detergent in question until you find the best compromise. Okay, I'm going to give you back to Rachel now to round up. Thank you very much, Steve, and I want to say thank you to all of you for attending today's webinar. You've been a brilliant audience. We've had lots of questions submitted to us, so thank you very much for those. Um, if you haven't received an answer to your question yet, we will get in touch by email over the next couple of days. May I wish you the best for your um, IP experiments and your research in general. And goodbye. <laughs>